Welcome to our chill. Can I just reiterate uh, Mark's welcome? <coughs> My name is Tony Sujanski. I'm Director of Quality at Edge Chill. I work very closely with both Mark and with Helen in the registry uh, in relation to our quality assurance processes in general, how they interface with our academic regulations, and in particular, uh, in this instance, the external examiner system, which is, uh, if you like, regulated by our registry colleagues um, and feeds into our annual monitoring processes. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that in your own institutions. Um, I, I guess there isn't very much difference in the way we do things here with the way we do things in, in your home institutions. Might just be worth, just to help me, uh, a show of hands, how many of the colleagues in the room have already been external examiners for other institutions? That's quite, quite a few. I'm not sure what the proportion is. Maybe half, just over half. OK, thank you. So the rest are novices. First time out. OK, um, this is a bit of a one-size-fits-all introduction to external examining for the next quarter of an hour. Um, as Mark says, I want to locate it within the national expectations, and then we'll move into looking at how Edge Hill does things, and that needs to seamlessly into the, the little reading exercise that we've prepared for you uh, in about 15 minutes' time. <laughs> so as far as context is concerned, how did we arrive at this external examiner system? It is fairly um, unique uh, in uh, global terms. Uh, we've had an external examiner system for some time. Uh, most other uh, countries of the world do not, um, and their form of uh, regulation and quality assurance differs somewhat fr from ours anyway. Over time, and we can start with Deering in 1997 and work our way through that timeline, you can see that we have, as a, as a sector, uh, periodically revisited the external examiner system to ask questions about its fitness for purpose, how it operates, is it delivering what uh, we as a sector expect from it in terms of reinforcing our confidence in standards. If you look sort of halfway down that list roughly to 2008-9, um, there, was, there was quite a flurry in the sector at that time. Politicians were asking questions about the relationship between external examiners and uh, higher education institutions. Was it a little bit too cosy? Was it a little bit too incestuous? Was it really uh, a guardian of standards or was it really just, just uh, you know, the old boys club in operation? Uh, and at that time, a number of things were floated, including, quite controversially, the notion of a national pool of externals, which would be taken uh, out of the hands of higher education institutions, regulated somewhere centrally. We're not quite sure where it would have been, but it would have been separate from us, and we would have uh, effectively been, draw been drawing on that pool of uh, external examiners whenever we wanted to launch a new programme. Um, that wasn't taken forward, however, watch this space. Um, if we move down through that list, probably the next important uh, milestone was the redevelopment of the QAA Quality Code. Um, that was an 18-month exercise which embraced the whole of what used to be called the academic infrastructure. Uh, and chapter B7, the Code on uh, External Examining, was the very first chapter uh, of the brand new Quality Code to be overhauled and rewritten. I was actually on the advisory group, national advisory group for that chapter, which was an interesting experience because we weren't just looking again at, at externally examining how it works and how it should work. We were also producing the template for the whole code um, and ironing out some of the, the, uh, the technical issues that emerged as we were writing that chapter. So an interesting experience for me personally um, back in 2012. So um, what were the things that have given cause for concern, or at least asked questions, raised questions in relation to external examining. Transparency, as I've already hinted at, was one of the big questions. Um, what is an external examiner? Where do they come from? Um, are they an inspector? Or are they actually somebody who works very closely w with, with academics and institutions to help them in a developmental way? Um, the answer is probably a bit of both. Uh, and that's certainly how we regard external examiners uh, here at Edge Hill and how we would hope that you would see yourselves when entering into that role. Um, a number of questions that were posed about the, the powers of the external. What, what was their uh, authority? Uh, can an external examiner unilaterally rule uh, on marks and insist on making changes uh, to marks that have already been awarded through an internal assessment and moderation process. 
Um, we say no. Uh, we're very clear that our external examiners are our advisors. Uh, we take what our external examiners say very seriously. And if they have grave concerns, then we have mechanisms to remark, to rescale, uh, whatever adjustments need to be made to a whole cohort in order to ensure fairness to every single student in that cohort. But uh, in the normal run of events, our external examiners comment on our, our moderation process and on the outcomes from it. Uh, external examiners' contribution to enhancement. Uh, you'll see um, as we move into looking at our external examiner report, we do have a section which asks you explicitly to highlight for us anything that you've seen from your uh, review of coursework, from your conversations with course teams, that you think is conspicuously good practice. Innovative, distinctive, particularly successful. Um, that is very important for us as an institution because it enables us to identify where good things are happening, to harness those good things and to spread them more widely uh, within the institution which is basically the, the definition of enhancement in QAA speak. So those were some of the things I think that uh, we were batting about uh, during the, the uh, um, revision of, of chapter, chapter B7 and the uh, overhaul of the quality code. So here is chapter B7. I, I'm not reproducing the whole thing for you. Uh, I guess you, you may or may not be familiar with, with some aspects of it. It's easy to find on the QAA website, but I've just pulled out one or two of the indicators of sound practice. Um, and I've emboldened in these slides some of the key words that I think uh, are, are definitely worth uh, considering and exploring in, in perhaps more detail. If we start with the expectation, the bit that sits at the top, this is the mandatory bit. Um, this is the bit that we are tested on by QAA when they come in to review us uh, as individual institutions. It's a very simple expectation. Some would say rather bland expectation. Higher education providers make scrupulous use of external examiners, whatever scrupulous uh, means. It's pretty difficult to see how you couldn't, in, in broad terms, meet that expectation. But of course, underneath that sit these things called indicators of sound practice, and that's where the devil of the detail uh, resides. If we look at uh, indicator two, uh, an institution... Uh, should be seen or external examiners will be helping us to ensure that we are maintaining the threshold academic standards uh, set for our awards. What are threshold academic standards? They are the minimum level of achievement that a student needs to have demonstrated in order to graduate with an award at a particular level in a particular subject. How do we establish our threshold standards? Well, when we're writing programmes, we benchmark them to the national level framework, the FHEQ. That tells us that uh, a bachelor's degree really is a bachelor's degree and not a uh, foundation degree masquerading as a bachelor's degree. Um, and the FHEQ has a set of level descriptors and it enables course developers to be able to write their learning outcomes in a way that is equivalent to the level of the programme that they're seeking to deliver. So that's one way of uh, setting threshold standards. Um, the other reference point, of course, is the subject benchmark statement for the degree. There are about 50-odd subject benchmark statements at honours degree level, just a little bit, a little bit more than that, fewer at master's degree level. Um, and they are important because unlike the FHEQ, which is generic, it's to do with level, uh, subject benchmark statements also talk to us about the content, the knowledge, the understanding, the skills, specific skills, transferable skills um, that you would expect to see in, for example, uh, a bachelor's degree in English. So 50-odd subject benchmark statements, somewhere within those, your degree, the degree that you deliver and the degrees that we deliver will reside. Uh, they are very comprehensive. Not always that transparent. You sometimes have to search for your subject within a cluster of subjects, but nonetheless, you will find a reference point. Um, and when you're externally examining, we are asking you to make a judgment for us on whether we are hitting that threshold standard based on your knowledge, your knowledge of the framework for higher education qualifications and your familiarity with your own subject benchmark statement. So it isn't um, a subjective uh, assessment that we're asking you to make. It is very much rooted 
in those national level descriptors and subject benchmarks. Uh, and as you'll see when we look at our report form, we actually put you on the spot. We say, in your view, do you judge that we are at least meeting, if not exceeding, the national threshold standards? And you've got to say yes or no. So I don't want to frighten you, but that's your academic reputation there that's sitting on that question. And the way to answer it, really, is, is rather than just relying on your past experience to go back to these national reference points and just confirm for your own peace of mind that when you say yes to that question, as I hope you will more often than not, that it's actually got some scientific evidence there sitting behind it that will underpin that judgment. Um, we talk about threshold standards, everything beyond threshold, and for threshold we could say colloquially a pass mark, right? That's threshold standard. Everything beyond threshold standard in terms of performance criteria, classifications, grades, uh, is very much left to individual institutions to decide through their regulations. Now, we classify degrees. We have two twos, thirds, two ones, firsts. Um, and the question we'll be asking you there is, beyond threshold, are our standards comparable with the standards that you've seen in other institutions, including your own? So are we meeting the threshold are we comparable beyond threshold? Those are the two big questions uh, that we ask our external examiners to answer. Indicator three, this is the one around enhancement, pulling out those good things and exposing them more widely or enabling us to expose them more widely. Indicator 12, producing an annual report, which we'll come back to in a moment. Indicator 13, <laughs> um, Confirming that we have given you the tools to do the job that we've employed you to do. So have you received the coursework samples? Are they appropriate range uh, of, of, of samples? Have you got the mark sheets? Have you got the assessment briefs? Have you got the marking grids so that you can triangulate all of these things to arrive at those judgments on the standards? And if we haven't given you the tools, what do we need to give you in future? Have we taken account of the things that you've said to us in your previous report? Have we responded to your comments? We may not always be able to action your suggestions, but we should always and must always respond to them. So there is a question there on the report form. Have you received a response to your previous report? Professional body requirements is an interesting one. We do have a number of professionally focused programmes here at Edge Hill, teacher training, nursing, number of other programs in our arts and sciences faculty which are professional body regulated. Um, now in some programs we actually recruit um, colleagues not necessarily from academic institutions but from uh, professional backgrounds to work with academic examiners in regulating the standards of those awards. So you would expect to see in our health faculty a number of practitioners engaged in quasi external examiner roles. However, every programme must have an academic external as well. And in many cases, the one person fills the two roles because uh, an academic external in the area of nursing will most likely be a member, well, will be a member of the Nursing and Midwifery Council, will have registration, uh, and will also you know, be able to help us uh, benchmark to the agenda of that professional body as well as the QAA. So professional body requirements are an aspect uh, of, of this as well. Um, and at the very end of the uh, three years, four years, four years? Three or four years, depending on circumstances, um, an invitation to you to reflect on that period of office. Um, how the programme has developed in your time uh, of being associated with it and how we um, uh, have helped you uh, to develop in your role. Um, there's a list of things, I'm not going to go through these minutely, they're on the slides, the things that we ask you to do, looking at coursework, um, briefs before they're issued to students. Yes? Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, very important briefing because it's, it's transition, isn't it? It's handover. Context. <coughs> So let's just rattle through these because I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, approving examination papers, looking at coursework briefs before they're issued, coming in and doing the moderation at the end of the year, 
before the assessment board, going to the assessment board, uh, putting the stamp of your authority on the outcomes of, of that board and also endorsing the functioning of that board. Because uh, another thing that external examiners have to do, apart from looking at coursework and, and verifying standards, is to verify that we as an institution are uh, applying our regulations consistently and fairly in a technical sense. Now, that's got nothing to do with your subject. That's you as a neutral party coming in and saying, well, their regulations say that they can condone so much credit, or their regulations say that they have discretion in terms of how they um, uh, may move a, a classification up or down based on profile uh, or, or average percentage marks. Are they doing what they say they're going to do? They being we. And if the answer is no, we're inconsistent. We're not following our own regs. We really need to hear that from you, or at least I do, because I'm the one who's going to have to answer for it with Helen when QAA comes in and picks up on it for themselves. So you are our early warning system uh, as, as much as anything else. What else do we have? Um, I've mentioned changes to marks. Uh, we do uh, listen to what our external examiners have to say. In serious cases, we do have mechanisms for marking, remarking, rescaling marks if they're too high or too low. But in general terms, your function as an external moderator is to say to us in broad terms, without getting too hung up on individual marks, if they're only sort of a mark or two adrift of where you would position the student, are we broadly um, following our assessment criteria and applying them rigorously? Um, and then there's the report form, and we're actually going into that report form now, so I'm not going to dwell on those slides. I simply draw your attention once again, if it needs to be drawn to it, that those two questions about standards, threshold standards and comparability of standards beyond threshold, are absolutely core uh, to what, it, what we're expecting from you. So, we're into a, a little bit of um, group practical discussion activity now. Uh, you've got a, a, an external examiner report in your pack, suitably anonymised, and Mark's going to lead us into uh, this activity.